are. And also, we find out that sometimes our little unhealthy issues that we ignore, whoo, we really pay for them uh, when something like this happens. And so, uh, I just want to send a shout out and a blessing to everybody that has been just bombarding heaven for all the folks uh, and families that have been sick and such. And so, it's good to be back, right? It's good to be back. Smile at me. Show some love, hallelujah. Let me share a couple of things before I get into the Word because this has been uh, burning in my heart for weeks here, amen. I want to remind you about the things that are going on and remind you about the things that are happening. We still have our Monday nights, even though at this present time we're not meeting. We'll work on that as things come up, maybe over the next couple of weeks. But I want to encourage you ladies, I want to encourage you brothers. We're reading different books right now. I want to encourage you to discipline yourself. The way things are right now, for some, it can be really difficult. For others, it can be a lot easier. And so I'm trying to encourage the men on a weekly basis, a couple of times a week, just to get it finished. For those of you brothers that are watching, which you should be right now, if you're watching, you need to finish up chapter 6 this afternoon so that we get into the notes and everything that I'll send out to you the, and the list for starting chapter 7 on Monday night. And you can do this. This is going to be a, a, a good test for you. And so those of you ladies, the same thing. I believe the Sister Mona will be sending you out some information, and it'll be a blessing for you. You can get through this. It'd be an awesome thing for you to accomplish. Now, I know I, I, know I like meeting together with folks, and I like our Monday nights. That's my really, uh, really, uh, uh, that's where my heart beats uh, really well. But listen, um, to finish a book with all the complications that are happening right now and learn something through it, that is an incredible blessing for you. And I want to encourage you to look forward to that because it won't be the only book, even though we've read other ones, that you'll be able to do this. So, Monday nights, stay connected. Um, uh, try to get the information out to everybody. Try to use I try to break down each chapter for everybody, and I think that'll be a help for you. Wednesday night, we're on Facebook, live streaming. We're also on Instagram. I just got to encourage you, especially this Wednesday, because I'm going to start a message today that I'm not going to be able to finish. I'm going to take it into Wednesday, so you're going to have to be with us on Wednesday. I just want to encourage you about that. Now listen, Saturday morning, <clears throat> we're going to open the building up for prayer. I know we don't have a whole lot of folks that come on Saturday morning, but we're going to open up the building for prayer. Um, <clears throat> we start at 8 o'clock. Uh, I want to encourage you to bring your masks. Be wise. We're going to, we're going to uh, start at 8 o'clock at about 8.45 or so. Um, I'm going to do a devotional. I'm going to read some things to everybody, some encouraging words and some challenging words. I'm going to start doing this on a Saturday, just about 15 minutes before we end uh, our 8 o'clock morning prayer, about 8.45. So I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. Those of you, um, 6 or 8, that have been a consistent thing, y'all can come back. But I, I really want to encourage you, call somebody and invite them. This will be a good opportunity to connect. Bring your mask. We'll have all the things that are needed here. But uh, we just need a, a time where we can gather in corporate prayer. We won't be holding hands or anything like that. But I will open the building up at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. And so don't forget all this stuff. We have some uh, new things that are coming up right now. Uh, this is Mission Sunday. Uh, for those of you that, that, that understand, we still have a lot of things that are going on. In other parts of the world, we still have a lot of uh, ministry that's happening. And so I'd just like to encourage you to continue in, in your consistent giving. Um, you can do anything right now that we can help you with. You can uh, text the word GIVE or GIVE to 650 900 59 You can call the church office if you need some help. So Simone will pick up the phone and she'll help you through that. What's really easy, you can go on the church on the church app and tightly, and you can do it all yourself. You can actually set it so it does a regular giving. I do that with missions. I do a regular giving with missions so that I know that every month, uh, like today, it'll come out and it'll take care of that. You know, um, if you're not a Christian and you're watching this and your life has just had some struggles and you're battling I, I, you don't have to worry about giving. I don't want to say anything that's confusing. You don't have to worry about giving to God. What I want to encourage you to do is I want to encourage you to give your life 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's something God wants to give you. He wants to give you uh, salvation. He wants to give you forgiveness. He wants to give you a brand new start. He wants to give you um, the power to let good things start happening in your life. To help and bless and, and to do that for other people. He wants to help you with your problems. He can't help you with your problems. Until you become a son or a daughter. Until you connect with him. It's like wanting to talk to somebody. But never making a phone call. Or never going to see that person. And so we don't have the ability to do good things. We don't have the ability to forgive on our own. We need God. We need Christ to do that. And so for those of you that are Christians. I just want to encourage you. Always make it a priority. To faithfully support the work of God within your local church. I know we have things we use a lot of finances to do. There's a lot of things that we like doing. There's a lot of things that you probably like doing on a regular basis. But your consistency into giving into your local church, that says where your heart's at. That shows where your heart's at. And if you support the local church naturally, you're supporting the gifts and you're supporting uh, the, the work of the ministry with your gifts and with your validation of that being the place where God is using the projects that God challenges people to give. Your, your faithful giving is, is probably more, says more about your heart than anything else. Now, if you're battling and you're struggling in giving, and maybe that's been a struggle in your life for a while, I just want to encourage you. I'm going, to, I'm going to challenge you. Take a 90-day test. Put God to the test. That's what the scripture says. God said, prove me through the prophet Malachi. Put God to the test. Take 90 days. That's three months. And give consistently and faithfully. At the end of those three months, if you're not in a better place, if your finances are not greater, have a greater blessing on them from your consistency of honoring the Lord. After that 90 days, you quit. Because, because it may mean that you really never gave your heart over to the Lord. But when it comes to giving even the worldly and even the secular, know about charity and charitable giving. Because it, it is like planting a seed in the ground. It brings forth a harvest and a blessing. And so I just want to challenge you to do that while you can right now as we get ready to get into the Word uh, where you're at, if you can bow your heads with me, I'm going to pray and ask a blessing over the families and those who, who, who honor the Lord and who give. And I want to pray also for this message that we're going to be having here this morning and we're going to be hearing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your grace and I thank you for your mercy. I invite your Holy Spirit right now to come and to be with us. I pray, Father, that you would challenge us, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you would open our hearts and help us to hear from you and to listen and to do whatever it is, God, that we need to do to let your truth sink into our lives. I pray for this message. I pray for the people that are giving. I pray for the people, Lord Jesus, that have through years been consistent. I speak a blessing as a, as a pastor, as a Levite blessing, as a priest blessing into their households and into their families. I thank you for your goodness, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit have its way. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Are you excited this morning? We want to let you know that today is Pastor Phil's uh, birthday. Uh, 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 you know, we're so excited to celebrate his birthday. We were not able to celebrate it with everybody, all of you, but you can join with us as we sing happy uh, birthday uh, to him. <laughs>
<laughs> Woo! <clears throat> man, that got me. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. What, a, what an incredible blessing. Hallelujah. What an incredible blessing. All right, if you've got your Bibles, go get your Bibles. Or pick it up wherever it's at and, and get it in your hand. You're going to need it here for a few moments. You know, there's been a, there's been a lot of conversation that has been uh, I've had with some of the leaders and stuff. There's been a lot of situation that I've been able to think through with all that's been going on. And uh, I want to share something with you here uh, this morning that you heard me speak of a couple of weeks ago before I ended up getting sick and, and I was out of the picture for a while. Thank you for those of you that have just been praying, again, consistent and still doing what God's called you to do. But I started talking about spiritual warfare. And so, uh, you know, there's a war going on and we are at war. And I know that probably, I feel that, let's put it that way. I've always known that, but I feel that more now because of what the last three, four weeks have been like. Really, three, three weeks. And so I want to use this opportunity to start something that I know I can't finish today, but I, I will promise you I'm going to continue it. So Wednesday, when we come back on Wednesday, I'm going to step a little further into it, see if I can complete it there. And if not, I'll, I'll take it another step further. But I want to talk about spiritual warfare. And uh, I'm, titling, I'm titling this The Enemy, or Defeating. Defeating the Enemy. Now, everybody has an enemy. If you're a believer, we all have an enemy. We know that's the devil. Satan's goal is not to destroy our lives, that's what we always say, but in all reality, just to get us disconnected from our Heavenly Father. He'll use discouragement, he'll use whatever it is that he can use, maybe to make us quit, to make us give up, to make us uh, struggle through some, uh, to tap into areas of our life that we haven't been paying attention to. Uh, there's a lot of that. And so this morning, this message comes out of the book of Samuel. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Samuel, chapter, uh, chapter number 17, and I'm going to begin writing, reading, I'm sorry, reading. Um, let's start at verse number 16 of 2 Samuel, chapter 17. I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to do my best. I only have a couple of points for you, because there's a whole lot in this, and I'm just doing it as a, as a launch this morning. Verse number 16 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. And give these ten cuts of cheese to their captain." And see how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they're doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd. Now, you need to mark that down for those of you that are, that are good, good readers and studiers in, in, the, in the Word of God. Notice that that even though David was a shepherd and he was watching over his father's sheep, when he left to do what his father asked him, he made sure that there was still somebody, another shepherd who took over, who could watch over the sheep. He didn't just abandon, he didn't just quit, he didn't just take off because he got some new ministry and he didn't care about everything else. And that's a whole different sermon there. So he left the sheep with another shepherd. He set out early the next morning with the gifts, as Jesse, his father, had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Verse 21. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine, the champion from Gath, he came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant, the menace? 
He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. Verse 26, last verse read out. David asked the soldiers standing by or nearby, What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed, listen, look at that, look at that in your scripture, that he is allowed to defy, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God. This is a very powerful scripture about the enemy. And it is popular. I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you take the opportunity to read uh, certain books, but if you've ever read like the book Facing Your Giants, this is, is coming from that. Let me, uh, let me read you, if I can, the, uh, the uh, opening of that portion of uh, Facing Your Giants. And uh, let, let, me, let me just say this before we go any further. And, and I'm reading, I'm reading, I wrote it down in pencil, so I'm trying to get a little, enough light on it there. there so, sometimes, sometimes God will put a Goliath in your life for you to find the Daniel that is in you. Let me read it again. Sometimes God, remember, God himself will put a Goliath in your life for you to find the Daniel that is within you. Now, that's a heavy, heavy statement, but it's a true statement. Go back to the scripture and look at verse number 16, what it says. It says that for 40 days, twice a day, during the day and closer to the evening, more than likely, this Philistine, Goliath, he mocked the children of Israel. Let me read you another quote out of the book, Facing Your Giants, because I know some of you have read them. There's been a couple of the brothers that have too. Let me give you a quote. You know your giant. He taunts you with bills you can't pay, people you can't please, habits you can't break, failures you can't forget, and a future that you feel like you can't face. But just like David, you can face your giant. Even if you aren't the strongest, the smartest, the best equipped, or even the holiest. You could read David's story, and you could wonder what God saw in him. He fell just as often as he stood. But for those who know the sound of a Goliath, David gives this reminder. Listen to this quote, it's from the book. Focus on giants and you stumble. Focus on God and your giants tumble. That's a good one. Focus on giants and you will stumble. But if you focus your eyes on God, your giants will be defeated and they will tumble. So you may not see your giant like a Goliath. Your giant may not wear an armor. Your giant may not have this huge sword to use against you. He may not have the talents of a warrior as such, okay? He may not, uh, he may not have what you picture in your mind that Goliath had, nine feet and however the height and breadth and how his, you know, his strength was. But your giant will taunt you every day and every night about a lot of things, like what I mentioned from the book, about maybe unpaid bills or past sins in your life that periodically are brought back around and re reminded, you are reminded of them in order to defeat you. Sometimes it can be a, a, a marriage that's falling apart, a, a marriage that's going through struggles. Your giant could be a job that you don't like. You hate going to that job. You detest that job. It could be because of somebody that's on that job. Now I say that because of this. And let me make a point. Goliaths 
Goliath's ancestors had been Israel's enemies for a long, long, long time. As a matter of fact, Joshua was told by God to annihilate them and to destroy them. The problem is, Joshua didn't do everything as well as he should have. Because he didn't destroy the inhabitants of Gath and maybe one, uh, two or three other uh, towns. I didn't remember their, their names right now. He didn't destroy the inhabitants of where this giant came from. Goliath was from the Gath people. He was from that area. Now, why is this such a big deal? And why is it important to see this? And why am I even bringing this up? Well, that brings me to my first point that I want to give to you, okay? Because if, if you leave, if you leave your old enemy, if you give your old enemy a leg to stand on, you've heard that term before. If you give your old enemy a leg to stand on, somewhere down the line, he will rise up and you will have to fight him again. You see that point? Now, you're not writing this down. You can always look on our Facebook and the notes are there. It'll help you and it'll remind you. But that's the big deal. You've probably heard that statement before. Don't give, don't give anybody a leg to stand on. Well, the enemy works the same way because we are at war. And, it, and, it's, and it's not just for this COVID sickness that's going through and struggling. He, he's at war for our soul. And many times we don't focus on how important that is. Maybe, just maybe, you're dealing with issues in your life that come from the past. Maybe you're struggling with things that have crept back up in your life. Maybe there's things that are happening to you that you didn't realize and now you're looking at them that they've been handed down to you. Maybe your, your, your parents and your grandparents had to deal with things that you're dealing with now. Sometimes, sometimes some of us come out of families where alcohol was the biggest bondage. Sometimes many of us come out of families where drugs and, and different, uh, and different uh, uh, chains that held families together. And it gets passed down from one generation to the next. It can be addictions. It can be things like divorce, believe it or not. It can be anger. You grew up in a house where, where anger was an exploding thing, and, and it's one of the reasons why you have that in your life. You grew up in a house where parents or grandparents battled things like depression and, and struggled through things and, and, and had difficulty through things. And, and so when the Israelites, when they heard this, this cry from this giant, when they heard the Philistines' challenge, the Bible says in verse number 11, and you can go there and check it out. The Bible says in verse number 11 that they were fearful and they were scared. It says when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and they were deeply shaken. Now let me give you a good example of what I'm talking about when you give the devil a, a, a leg to stand on. In the book of Matthew, you can turn there if you have your Bibles. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 12, starting with verse number 43, Jesus gave this example. I'm going to read it for you. You can read it. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 43 uh, to 45. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert, seeking rest, but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person that I came from. And so it returns, and it finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. If you're reading New King James or King James, it says garnished. But everything has been taken care of. Everything looks good. Then, verse 45, the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and they live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. 
Now, this is a good example. We've heard it before, I think a couple of weeks back. Uh, one of our leaders, one of our elders here, whatever you want to call him, Brother Oscar, ministered, and, and just some, I may be off on the time because, you know, it was a couple of weeks that it was rough. But sometime back, he, he used this scripture. And this is a powerful scripture where, where Jesus speaks about an unclean spirit that comes out of somebody. When that unclean spirit leaves that person, and that person is now free from that unclean spirit, there is something about being empty. It says that unclean spirit comes back when there's nowhere else he can go. Comes back and it looks through the windows and it realizes the doors have been fixed. The carpet has been cleaned. The holes in the wall have been patched. There's a new paint job. Some of the windows that were broken. Everything looks really nice. But notice in the scripture in Matthew that everything is empty. It's swept. It's garnished. It looks nice. It looks like it's in order. But it's empty. So a lot of what God does in our life, a lot of what the Holy Spirit works through in our life to free us from bondages, to free us from sin, to free us from addictions, to free us from things that, 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 that drive us crazy or that hinder us, leaves us empty when we're not filling the well with God's Word, with with. Connecting with one another. I could use the term fellowship, even though in a sense we're not doing that in a physical sense, but we're trying to keep in touch and connect with everybody. And, and here's a good word for those of you that are in leadership in the ministry. Those of you that have been saved for like, you know, 15 million years. No, I'm just kidding. You know, 15, 20 years. You've been saved that long. You ought to know how important it is right now at this time. For you to call, connect, see how people are doing. Not to gossip and tell them who else is sick and who else is in trouble. But to make sure that they're okay and intercede for them. Because what happens in our freedom and our delivery is that when our lives are empty, we are, the, we are still uh, uh, an open door. There's still an opportunity for the enemy finding us empty. To step back into our life. That old habits can come back into your life. Old, old ways of thinking can come back into your life. And this, and this struggle that we're in right now. Where we're not celebrating together. We're not meeting together. We're not worshiping together. And I'm telling you. I know because I've battled it. We start battling certain things. And then our mind starts telling us some weird stuff. And if you've not had that happen. I don't know who's more weird. Because the enemy, he, he, he tried to discourage me in a big way. I don't, I don't like being sick. I don't like not knowing how to fix something. And I couldn't fix me. And I couldn't, I couldn't eat. I couldn't do a lot of stuff. And, and the bombarding that went on of, of things that, 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 are, that are way back there. So far back, you have, to, you have to turn the camera that way just to show you how far back it was. And it was a reality check that no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been with the Lord, that there's still things that the end. You and I are still living in this fleshly body, and the enemy can still utilize that against our lives. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 11, in the Message Bible, it says, They heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified, and they lost all hope. If that's what you feel when you go through things, if that's what you feel when the enemy starts taunting you, if that's what you feel, you and I, you need to do what David did. The Bible says that as Goliath moved closer, look at verse number 11. I lost it. Look at verse number 11. As Goliath moved closer, Oh my God. No, that's not verse number 11. Verse number, verse number uh, 48. Verse number 48. You got to go to verse number 48. I was in the wrong place. Verse number 48 says, As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Now, for some of us, that's part of our old nature. Some of y'all, you were real good fighters. Yeah, yeah, you were. You were. And there's some of you that if I ever got into a fight, I, I, I could probably pick on one hand. 
who, who I would want at my side. And, and those of you ladies, there's a couple of you too that, that were probably fighters. And it's not because you, you got scars on your knuckles or anything like that. But, you know, word gets around uh, when you first get saved and testimonies get shared. And I'm telling you this because I want you to listen. David, David, as, as, as Goliath decided to attack, David ran out to meet him. He refused to let the enemy intimidate him. Let me read you something from the book, Facing Your Giants, that Max Lucado writes. I'm going to slowly bring this into the last point I'm going to use. He says, when we retreat, we retreat and hide behind a desk. Maybe we'll crawl into a gathering or a club or into some forbidden love. For a moment at the time, we feel safe, insulated, kind of uh, anesthetized. But when the work runs out, when the liquor of the high wears off, when the person leaves you and moves on, and we hear Goliath again, you need to rush your giant. With a God-saturated soul. I've read this before. And you need to tell him, tell that giant in your life, giant of divorce, you're not coming into my home. Giant of depression, you're not messing with me anymore. Jesus has set me free. You won't conquer me. Alcohol, bigotry, child abuse, insecurities, all those things that are trying to work their way back into your life or my life, you're all going down. Think about this. When was the last time, like David, you picked up your sling and you ran towards the roar of a giant in your life who is already defeated? Remember that. You know that as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, any giant in your life, any past sin in your life, anything that the enemy can throw at you to remind you of where you came from or what you were like or where you've been. Next time the devil reminds you of things from your past, why don't you open up your Bible and remind him of his future? Because he's a goner. He's going to be chained. It's going to be a joke. But while he can deceive us, he's going to do everything he can to deceive us. Let me give you a little insight before I bring this to a close, okay? Goliath was from Gath. If you go back to the book of Joshua and you read about the cities, that Joshua was supposed to destroy. This city, Gath, was the same city when the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. It was the same city that the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant into. And because they took the Ark of the Covenant, which was for the children of Israel, and it carried the presence of God, during the time that the Ark was in Gath, the Bible says that God cursed them with hemorrhoids. That is a curse. Mice. And, and I don't know if it was one other thing. Horrible, horrible consequences to their lives because they stole the Ark of the Covenant and took it to them. They did everything they could. They made gold rats and they made gold, I don't know how they did it, uh, of their curses and they put them all over the cart and they hooked the cart up to two baby calves who had just been weaned from their from their mother uh, uh, cows and, and they put them on the cart and they said if this is God the cart will go where it's supposed to be and if this God is just a big nothing and nothing but a no big deal then the calves are going to follow to their mothers who are over there wailing for them and the Bible says those calves took the Ark of the Covenant straightway back to the children of Israel. That's the same people and the same place that Goliath came from. 
most of our battles and most of your struggle and most of the difficulties that we go through, listen to me, most of them come from our past. Most of our fears, especially in spiritual warfare, creep up into our life from the past. Things that we never shook loose. Things that we claim were under the blood of Jesus. But in reality, the enemy catches us at moments when we're weak, when we're struggling. Listen to me. For about three weeks, you have no idea how weak I have felt. How many things went through my mind. Some of the dreams that I had, they were, they were horrible. I, maybe I'll share them with you somewhere down the line, but they were horrible. And I would wake up in the morning or the middle of the night, man, where does all that come from? And I realized that, that, I, didn't, that I didn't understand it, even though I, I, was, I, was, I think I was just battling some virus and flu. There's a war going on for my soul, for my future, for the, for the things that God wants to do in your life and mine. For the destiny He has for us. For the people He wants to make us into that we are called by God to become. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, in verse number 19, if you use New King James Version or King James Version, it says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, some of you can quote it, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard like a flag of victory. He will lift up a standard against the enemy, against him. I'm going to give you this last point. We're going to finish this on Wednesday because I really want to pray and I want to give you a chance. I want to give you an opportunity. You know, something happened in this new book that we're reading on, uh, on waking the dead. Um, after every chapter, there's, there's a page, sometimes a page and a quarter, but there's a good page where, like in the Psalms, it says Selah. And what the writer of the book tells us to do, asks us to do after every chapter, is to stop. Don't go reading another chapter. Stop. Pause right there. You know, we don't do this. And he tells us, pause right here and, and let what you've just read in this chapter, let it sink in. Let your mind think about some of the things that you just heard and maybe some of the things you underline in the book. And he, and he shares some highlights of those. What went through your mind when you read this that, that, that I wrote down here and this example or this story? And we don't do that a lot, you know. Uh, honestly, most of us read to finish a book just so we could say we read it and we finished it, but we never read it to feed off of it. And now as Christians, we have to change the way... We're doing things. And so I, I, I want you to pause a little bit after hearing what I shared this morning. And I want you to think about that as we get back here on Wednesday. I want you to think about it. This is important. There's a war going on for our souls. And that war is, 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 is not against this building. This building is just a building. That war is against the church. And the church are the people. And whatever we're battling, whatever we're struggling, if you think about it, a lot of what the enemy uses are things that, are, that have already been a battle within our lives. I know there's new struggles. I know there's new uh, tactics that he uses. Actually, not always. Discouragement and things like that to defeat us, those are the most common things that he works on us. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I want you to listen to this point. I want you to hold this point up until Wednesday. But I'm going to close with this. God has given you and me, God has given us the power to fight this battle and to win. Use it, church. Do you listen to me, praise chapel? Use it. If, if, you, if you think that because you're not perfect enough, you can't use it, you've not read your Bible. Because the Bible doesn't say anything about you having to be perfect for God to honor His Word. What God looks for is faith, even in a broken vessel. you got to use it. When the devil reminds you of your past, when he brings up old stuff, when he, when he comes against you and discourages you, read your word against it. That's what Jesus did when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't, he didn't give him his own opinion. He used the word of God and spoke right to the enemy, and the enemy had to quit. 
Next time he reminds you of your past, go to the book. Open the Bible. Remind him of his future. Tell him, hey, sucker, you're history. You're a big joke. Yeah, you can mess with my mind now, but there's going to come a time when your days will be over in ruining people's lives. That's what God wants you to understand about the war and the battle that we're in. And we are, Praise Chapel, listen, we are at war. It's time for us to think seriously. More seriously than we've done before. About spiritual warfare. And making sure our battle cry is up to our preparedness. With all the things the enemy wants to defeat us. So close your Bibles where you're at right there. Close your Bibles. Put them down. Put them away. And move them aside. We're going to pray before, we're, uh, before we close here this, uh, this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, God for your help and your strength over the body of Christ. Like David who defeated Goliath, Lord, I pray for us to have an understanding. I pray, God, even though our giants aren't like Goliath, I pray even though our giants don't have a huge sword, and sometimes our giants don't speak, but we hear them, and we battle failures in our life. We battle our inconsistencies. Sometimes we don't do things the way we should and we reap from that and then we battle things like that. Our relationships, our friendships, our marriages, even our relationship with our children. Lord, help us to look, help us to look past. Lord, I think about the prodigal son's father. I think about the fact that he had somebody watching so that he would know the first moment that his son was coming back. And I wonder in my mind that if that prodigal son's father was in today, and if he was in today with the ability to connect, would he have waited that long, or would he have been blowing up his son's phone, saying, are you okay? I miss you. You took off angry, are you still angry? I don't want you to live angry. People can't live angry. When they live angry, they make bad decisions. You see, we all have giants, Lord, and you know that. But you gave us the ability, you gave us the power to fight this battle. You gave us the power to have victory in this war. And I pray, God, that you help the body of Christ to use it, to use your word, to use the authority that has been given to us, to use what you have called us to use against the enemy. And to hold on to the destiny and the promises that you have made to us. You know, if you're listening this morning, and you're not a believer, God's looking for you. He is. Somebody has been praying for you. If your heart is not right with God, somebody's been praying for you, and that's why things have been going on in your life that have been shaking you up a little bit. I'd like to pray with you. I want you to pray a sinner's prayer. That's what we've always called it. Even though the Bible says that we're all sinners. But a sinner's prayer turns you into a saint as soon as you ask forgiveness from the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, right now I know above all things that I need a Savior. And I need forgiveness that I can only receive from you. I know I'm a sinner. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. I've not been heading in the right direction nor have I been doing the right things because I can't do that on my own. So I'm asking for help. Lord Jesus, I open my heart up so that you can move into it. So that over time, Lord, you can allow me to walk with you and to become more like you. And one day, Lord Jesus, leave this earth and step into your presence in heaven. I thank you for your cleansing of my life and forgiving of my sins. I make you Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
We have a lot to work on, a lot to dive into. Stay with us this week. Chris Chapel Almani, get connected on our Monday nights. Brothers, keep reading the book. Don't get lazy, it's really easy. Not being around the camaraderie to help each other. So I'm sending you information. Make phone calls to one another. Encourage one another. Tell them, hey, I found this. Did you read this part? Share with it. Let's do whatever we have to do to get through this. Don't let the enemy mess with you. Have a great day. Thank you for all the happy birthdays. I appreciate that. What an incredible blessing. Have a great day with your family. Continue to pray for those who are sick in their body. Continue to pray for those who are recovering. Recovery is a good thing. I thank God for recovery. But let's do what we're supposed to do as the body of Christ. Let's unite spiritually as much as we can. And let's have victory in this war because we're winners anyway. We read the end of the book, folks. We're winners. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. We'll connect and we'll finish on Wednesday night. Have a great day.